Thank you very much, Dr. Gadsden. Um, the for I'm Bill Beardsley from Boston Children's Hospital and a member of the committee. The format for this morning is our, each speaker will speak for 20 minutes and then we'll have 20 minutes of discussion. First, questions from the members of the committee and then from the audience. For this section, I'll be moderating and we have a great um, treat in store. Uh, Dr. Mark Bornstein will be our first speaker. He's senior investigator and head of child and family research at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development. He's the co-author of Development in Infancy, which has gone through five editions, Developmental Infancy through Adolescence, Lifespan Development, Infancy through Adulthood, and Perceiving Similarity and Comprehending Metaphor. Dr. Bornstein has administered both federal and foundation grants, sits on numerous editorial boards, is a member of a number of scholarly societies, and consults uh, to a variety of government organizations, foundations, universities, publishers, and the like. He's the editor emeritus of Child Development and founder, founding editor of Parenting, Science, and Practice. He's published in Experimental, Methodological, Comparative, Developmental, and Cultural Science, as well as Neuroscience and Pediatrics. And with this extraordinary background, he has 20 minutes to share his knowledge with us. <laughs> and we have 20 minutes to ask him questions. Thank you very much. Help me welcome Dr. Bornstein. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks very much for the invitation to speak here and uh, uh, for, my, uh, for my 20 minutes. I'm going to speak to general and specific positive parenting and some effects on children. Relative to the statement of task of your committee, I'm going to address uh, question number one or point number one, what are the core parenting knowledge, attitudes, and practices as identified in the literature that support healthy child development in the early years? So that's part one of my talk, namely the general. And then I'll turn to the second part of that first point. Do core parenting um, caps uh, differ for specific characteristics of children, parents, or contexts? So that's the second part of my talk, namely the specific, all right? Your question number three puts these two together. The committee will consider the appropriate balance between strategies tailored to unique parent and child needs and common strategies that can be effective and accepted by parents across groups. In other words, you've asked me to speak out of both sides of my mouth, and that's what I'm planning to do. So part one, the general. Let's stipulate that biological parents make a genetic contribution to their offspring, all right? But that's not what we're really concerned about here. What we're really concerned about is the experiences which parents provide children, namely um, uh, what, they, what they do and how they behave and what they're thinking and then how they interact with children uh, as instantiated in their cognitions and in their practices with children. All right, so our question really is which cognitions and which practices make what kinds of positive differences for children, okay? Now one of the uh, issues, the general issues which I've been asked to address is sensitivity, responsiveness, sensitive responsiveness, it's talked, this construct is talked about in a variety of different ways, all right? In order to talk about the power of responsiveness and sensitivity as a general mechanism in child development, I need to digress for a moment and then reintroduce it, all right? In developmental science, we're concerned with a number of things. One is the issue of stability over time. Time. So take vocabulary measured at time one and vocabulary measured at time two. Stability would indicate that the range of individual differences that children show at time one is maintained um, uh, across time to time two as opposed to children changing in their relative statuses uh, uh, across age. Now if we take language, and I'm going to use language as a leitmotif here as a continuing metaphor, stability in language means that children who perform well or poor early do so later, and so we're particularly interested in that stability. And so stability of language has meaning because language skills are necessary for children to learn through conversation and reading. Language skills predict literacy and academic achievement. Language skills also inform other cognitive domains like number concepts, spatial skills, memory, theory of mind. Moreover, language skills also relate to the development of children's social emotional functioning in terms of self-regulation and self-control. So the individual differences in language have uh, implications for a wide variety of aspects of children's development. 
Indeed, the 30 million word gap is becoming practically a national obsession um, uh, these days. So let's look at the individual differences and how they unfold in language. If we take um, a factor made up of children's actual speech, mean length of utterance, different word roots, of uh, mother's report about children's language from the early language in interview and the Vineland scales, and children's actual test testing in the renowned comprehension expression, we can make a factor of that. And what we see is that at 20 months, there is a degree of stability that's carried over to four-year language, into 10-year language, into 14-year language, OK? In a normative sample of 324 children. And um, this stability holds over and above exogenous variables of maternal verbal intelligence and maternal education. So there's something in the child and in the children, which is continuing from uh, the uh, second year of life through 14 years. It holds for girls and boys. It holds for preterm children as well as term children. It holds for low SES samples as well as the normative uh, middle SES sample I described earlier. And it holds for European American children as well as African American children. So this is a fairly robust phenomenon of early life. All right, that begins in the second, that, that is already present in the second year of life. So what gives rise to the display of individual differences that children show in their language, which is to some degree carried through into adolescence? Well, I come back to maternal verbal responsiveness, all right? That is, let's operationally define that as mother's prompt, contingent, and appropriate verbalizations to children's communicative or exploratory overtures. The child says something or does something, and the mother responds promptly, appropriately, and contingently. So here I've plotted for you the growth function, the proportion of children reaching 50 words in their language, all right, um, and the age at which they do so. And what you can see is that children in the sample who have highly responsive mothers reach, about half of them, reach the 50-word criterion when they're about 15 months old. All right? Compare that with children from the same middle class sample whose mothers are low in responsiveness. They reach that 50 word criterion at 21 months. This is a six month difference in the life of less than a two year old. That's a quarter of their lifespan. Already, those individual differences are being generated by this phenomenon of responsiveness on the part of mothers. Is it a genetic phenomenon? Well, we know that for a long time that contingent maternal responses to the vocalizations of adopted one-year-olds predict their communicative development. And this comes from the maven of behavior genetics, Bob, uh, Robert Plowman. All right? So this finding, in a sense, isolates validity of responsiveness per se as effective and separates it from alternative interpretations based simply on ge shared genetic variants. All right? So that's one of the practices that, um, that, uh, I've, uh, uh, that uh, instantiates parenting. One of the cognitions, um, uh, uh, we can turn now to, to talk about cognitions. So cognitions are key to understanding the climate of parenting. They influence child development, and they moreover generate and shape parenting practices in a kind of standard model that people have an idea, and then they act on it, and that has an effect on children. All right? Parenting cognitions come in a wide variety of flavors goals and expectations, attributions for successes and failures, self-perceptions of parenting, attitudes toward parenting, knowledge of parenting, all right? So now we know that sensitive responsiveness generates a splay of individual differences in children. What generates sensitive responsiveness in parents, all right? Well, it could be structural factors, the biological status of the infant, the health status of the mother, the socioeconomic status of the family. It could be some cognitive factors. IQ of mothers, education of mothers, mother's knowledge of parenting, child rearing, and child development. Or it could be some social emotional factors, personality, attributions of parenting, success and failures, self perceptions of parenting. So we went to West Virginia and studied first time mothers who were 13 to 40 years old and tracked their sensitivity as expressed to their children or between five months and 20 months of age. And in this study, we control for those structural factors like SES since they all come from the same um, communities in West Virginia. And what we found was that cognitive factors, in specific, mother's knowledge of parenting and child development, as opposed to her general IQ or her educational achievement, predicted her responsiveness. 
And among the social emotional factors, it wasn't general personality, it was self perceptions of parenting satisfaction and investment, which uh, influenced uh, mothers' express sensitivity and responsiveness. In other words, an implication for public health and intervention is to improve maternal sensitivity and mother child emotional relationships and presumably child language. It's to teach parenting and child development, as I think it should be taught in the high schools, and uh, to foster. Um, parenting uh, um, satisfaction and investment. And in fact, we have instantiated this work in a, um, in a program for parenting called Parenting in the Real World, which is used in uh, several Head Start programs in the southeast, southeastern part of the United States. All right. Let me turn uh, second to uh, the specific and remind you of what I call the specificity principle in parenting. That is specific experiences, specific parents provide specific children at specific times, exert effects in specific ways over specific aspects of child development. Okay, so that's a mouthful. So let me parse that principle into its constituents of experiences, person, child, time, mechanism, and outcome. First about experience, all right? Seeing oneself in a particular way leads to a diversity of affective and behavioral approaches to child rearing. More extroverted mothers and fathers express more positive affect toward their children and are more cognitively stimulating at home as opposed to less extroverted mothers. Seeing childhood in a particular way leads to that diversity of parenting. One in four parents in the United States thinks that a baby is born with a certain level of intelligence which cannot be increased or decreased by how those parents interact with a baby. Now, are, they go I know, are parents who believe that going to read to their children? That's a question. Seeing one's own children in a particular way leads to a diversity of affective and behavioral approaches to child rearing. Parents who regard their child as being difficult are less likely to pay attention or respond positively to their child's overtures, and their inattentiveness and non-responsiveness in turn foster further temperamental difficulties and cognitive shortcomings. So parenting cognitions of various sorts have effects on parenting, all right? What about practices? Let's predict in, these regression, um, uh, in this regression table uh, a variety of language measures uh, there in yellow, language comprehension at 13 months, and now we're looking across the second year of life during which um, those individual differences are being shaped, all right? So we have a variety of language measures, um, including that 50 words in production, across 13 to 21 months. And what we see here is that language responsiveness, highlighted in yellow there, predicts each one of those language outcomes, whereas play responsiveness on the part of mothers doesn't. <coughs> And if we look now reciprocally at children's sophistication of play, number of play acts, number of different play symbolic acts, and so on, it turns out that language responsiveness doesn't predict, but play responsiveness does. Again, with respect to specificity. Responsiveness to child language advances child language, not play, a sophistication, and responsiveness to play advances child play and not language. Is this phenomenon limited to, the, limited to play and language? No. Responsiveness to distress predicts children's regulation of negative affect and greater empathy and pro-social responding, but, resp but expressions of maternal warmth do not. Reciprocally, parental warmth predicts positive affect regulation, but responsiveness to distress does not. The second term of, of the specificity, specificity principle excuse me, uh, has to do with parent. We know that mothers and fathers divide the labor of child rearing differently with different effects on children. In fact, if we, go to, if we scope down and look at parent-child interaction doing the same thing with the same child, even mother-child and father-child play when contrasted, when both mothers and fathers share attentional focus on a toy with a child, Mothers follow the child's focus of interest, whereas fathers establish joint attentional focus themselves. Their strategies are different. Moreover, mother and father are not singularly involved. There is a co-parenting phenomenon which has been identified that's more than some of the sum of its parts. That is, there are direct effects of co-parenting on children as well as indirect effects. So if we look at mainly MDI as an outcome at 24 and 36 months, what we find is that a child who has an unsupportive mother and father from low SES families does fairly poorly. A child with an unsupportive mother but a support supportive father does better, as does a child with a supportive mother but an unsupportive father. However, a child with a supportive mother and a supportive father does even better. 
co-parenting is more than, as I said, more than the sum of its parts. All right? The third term in this principle it speaks to child effects. All right? Children differ in the extent and quality of their reactivity to stimulation, responsiveness. They differ in the definitiveness of their behavioral signals to parents, their readability. They differ in the degree to which their behaviors can be anticipated reliably, either from contextual events or the child's preceding behaviors, their predictability. And these affect parenting, all right? The formation of a close emotional bond with a child fosters the development of conscience in bold, assertive children, whereas gentle child-rearing techniques that de-emphasize power assertion are more effective toward the same end with, with shy, temperamentally fearful children. All right? Coming back to the language, young children who are low in socialization skills are slow in their expressive vocabulary development, and mothers with socially withdrawn or shy children engage in less of that contingent verbal interaction than mothers with less withdrawn children. Now we come to the term of time. All right? If we're trying to predict child performance at time two, over and above stability in the child and concurrent experience at time two, there is some phenomena which are subject to early experience effects. Maternal responsiveness, as identified in one study listed there, does. However, there are other phenomena which over and above child stability and early experience, it's really concurrent experience that makes a difference, like recovery of function from early deprivation or maternal positivity. There are still other kinds of parenting which need to aggregate through time, through time one to time two in order to affect performance, okay? Then, of course, different pathways, a, a, a mechanism of action operate in different spheres, all right? Identification and attachment uh, through socialization theory may be one. Conditioning, reinforcement, and modeling under learning theory for uh, the, uh, as influencing child development may be another. Instruction and scaffolding is a third. Or just having, uh, just outfitting your boy's uh, room with uh, construction toys and your girl's room with dolls, that is the opportunity structures parents provide, may be yet a third mechanism. And so we come to outcome, and I'm coming to the end of my talk here. If we're going to predict different outcomes in children, we have to be aware of what those outcomes are. And there are a, a children develop in multiple integrated domains. The physical domain, whether children proceed well in their nutrition, their health care, their physical activity and sleep, their safety and security, and when, when they reach adolescence, their reproductive health. In the social and emotional domain, Different factors influence temperament development, emotion understanding and regulation, coping and resilience, trust, development of the self, character, social competencies. In the cognitive domain, different factors at different times via different mechanisms and so forth may affect information processing and memory versus curiosity and exploration versus ma mastery motivation versus thinking and intelligence, problem solving, language and literacy, education achievement, moral development, and creativity. All right. Just one more study. If we look across cultures at mothers interacting with their five-month-old babies, um, and I've agglomerated here data from Argentina, Belgium, Brazil, Cameroon, France, Israel, Italy, Japan, Kenya, South Korea, and the United States, what you see is these are correlations, so I'm not arguing direction of effects, that mothers who promote their infant's physical development have infants who are more physically developed as opposed to other things. Mothers who encourage their infants to look at them and engage in dyadic interaction have infants who spend more time looking at their mother than other things. And mothers who encourage their infants' attention to objects, properties, events in the environment, naming, labeling, and so on, and outfit their infants' local environment with more interesting toys have infants who explore the environment more than other things. So there is a degree of attunement and specificity in mother-infant interaction by five months of age. So the specificity principle, again, states that specific experiences, specific parents provide specific children at specific times, exert effects in specific ways over specific aspects of child development. So your task, as I understand it, is to find sulfonylamide for parenting, the magic bullet, all right? And um, I don't envy you your, uh, your task. Or to put it the way the front page of the Washington Post put it two, years ago, uh, two days ago, experts can't even agree on how much salt is too much. <laughs> Thank you very much.